All right, good morning, pupils. Uh, just a heads up, I'm taping the class. Um, I've got a student who's missed several days, and I want to be able to watch it if need be. Um, so, but just be natural. Do your thing. No, you're not supposed to. Hey. Oh, sometimes we do get like the back of your. I watched it yesterday. My head. And you're in there. Yeah. You're immortalized. No. Is our dust up in there? Because that would be hilarious. Yeah, my clapback was real. That is perfect. <laughs> All right, I love that, and we captured it on film. Okay, so where are we? Unit two, cognition. We're about a third of the way through the second part of it, which is memory. And we've got a lot of activities and even some games and a couple bit a video and a movie uh, that I think will make this topic a little bit more engaging and interesting. But what I'm trying to do, and what I want you to do with me, is let's just knock out the details first. Let's get through the notes. I might even be able to finish the memory part today, and then we, we can uh, dive in to more of the hands-on stuff, more of the stuff that I think demonstrates some of the dynamics of memory, okay? So let's get the details out of the way. And we left off on the top of page six. Does that look right? Yeah. All right, different stages of memory. Number one, sensory storage. And some of this we already kind of went over when I was defining memory writ large. But uh, sensory storage is everything that you experience or sense from moment to moment, including right now. God bless you. I'm speaking. You can hear my voice. Maybe you're looking at me visually while I'm speaking. Maybe you're not. If you're not, God bless you, that's your loss. Because, come on, right? <laughs> right? So, I, I would like my delivery of this content to be multi-sensory. I sang to Lane this morning, and I, I brought it with the most baritone, operatic, competent vocal stylings I could muster. It was gorgeous. Thank you, sir. All right. Um, I'm, I'm trying to explain this stuff using my voice. Now, I don't know how my voice sounds to you. I know when I hear myself on tape, Luke, like when I watch that, I feel like, wait, that's what I sound like? You never sound like what you think you sound like. Right? So, um, but, but I'm speaking, I'm teaching, I'm explaining. Um, I'll entertain any questions you have, right? I like it to be more of a two-way process, but uh, right now, you're going through what's called sensory storage. So sensory storage, simply put, is all the sights and sounds and smells and experiences that you go through moment to moment. And, and this is where memory starts. Memory starts with whatever it is you're going to memorize. Whatever it is you're going to ultimately put on your computer screen. Remember the analogy from yesterday, uh, two days ago? And then ultimately, maybe if it's important to you, you're going to store it where? In your, in your brain's hard drive, which is what cognitive psychologists call long-term memory. Okay, so sensory storage, where memory starts, it's very brief. It's very short-lived. You're, you're recording information as it hits you. I, I said this on Monday, I'll say it again. Repeat back to me the last 50 words I said. No. You can't do it. I don't know anyone who could do it. I don't think Rain Man could do it. I don't think a savant could do it unless you maybe told them ahead of time, okay, starting in my next five words, I'm going to have you repeat them back to me. Go. Like, then maybe. But, of course, we don't keep track of every single thing we hear and see and read and experience from moment to moment. Because if we tried to do that, we'd be overwhelmed by content. It's not possible. There's too much. There's just too much. That would overwhelm even a supercomputer over time. All right, so sensory storage is brief. It's short-lived. It's how you process sensory information. Now, 
you have different sensory registers for each sense. I don't know. Do you feel like you're more of a visual learner? Do you need to see it, read it? Do illustrations help? Do pictures help? Or are you more of an auditory or uh, hearing-based learner? Definitely hearing. You think more hearing. Okay. So, I don't know. Hopefully, ideally, if I'm, if I'm teaching effectively and if I explain it well and my voice isn't just overly annoying, you know, I would like to think, hopefully, that there's some sort of teacher-student connection here where this style of instruction is something that might benefit you. But I get it. I understand that there are other students, especially in the age of screen addiction, that are more who are more visual. And it's hard for them to listen. It is. And I almost feel like, in some ways, technology has made that worse. But, um, you know, I, people do have different learning preferences. Do they have different learning styles? Maybe. Are there dozens of learning styles? I tend to think not. I, I do understand that some people prefer to read, some people prefer to hear, um, some people prefer to do. Well, some things, some content can't really be learned through doing. It can, you, you, just, you just have to have it explained to you. So anyway, that's that's the sensory storage part, okay? Um, it's how we keep track of information from moment to moment. So when you're taking notes, if you're taking notes, you can hear me. You can hear what I'm saying even after I stop. There's almost like an echo effect, right? If you look at me visually and then you close your eyes, You'll still see me for a brief moment. Try it. Huh? How about that eye candy? Right? Right? So, so there's, there's a visual sensory storage. We call that iconic. It's an icon. It's a, it's a picture. And it tends to last for about a half second. It doesn't have to be me. Look at an object. Look at the flag. Then close your eyes. You'll still see it for about a half second. And, and the auditory one is called echoic, echoic. And that lasts a little bit longer, usually for several seconds. Feast your eyes on that eye candy right there. Oh yeah, thanks. Okay, now, listen to the voice that sort of undermines the visual. No, just kidding, what's up? I, I just need to count what my friend sits in. Fifth row, Frank Second You have friends, no, I'm sorry. That was mean-spirited, wasn't it? Yeah, that was, that was great. harsh. My self-esteem has just been lowered. Are you a visual learner or an auditory learner? Would you rather read something or hear something? Read. Okay. Show of hands. Reading preference. Really? That's it? Yeah. Show of hands. Hear it. Okay. Yeah, I'm a little bold. Yeah, everyone I'm a little bold. I think everyone Okay. Off you go. All right. So that's, that's sensory storage, and let me say this one more time, the stuff, most of the stuff that you get sensory storage wise, it's gone. It's already gone. But what you pay attention to, what you feel like for whatever reason you've got to make a point of focus, goes into, let's go to number two, your short term memory, slash working memory. I don't think it says it in your outline, does it? Does it just say short-term memory? Yeah. Add to that, like, slash working memory. It, in, our, in our computer analogy, what is this? It's the screen. It's the screen. So on Monday, I said to you guys, all right, a lot of you guys are sophomores. we got maybe a senior or two, maybe two juniors, whatever. Um, think back to apartheid, South Africa. Okay. You pulled it out of your hard drive, you pulled it out of your long-term memory, and you had it on your brain's computer screen. Just an analogy. And I said, all right, Mandela, Tutu, De Klerk, past laws, um, you know, details related to that. Oh yeah, I kind of remember some of that. And once it's, once it's on your brain's computer screen, once it's in your short-term slash working memory, you know, we can play around with it a little bit. 
We can utilize it. We can tweak it. You know, we can add to it. We can reinforce it. That's where we are now. Two, short-term memory. Short-term memory. It's a brief memory store. It has limitations. Okay, short-term memory, working memory, it's brief. Not long-term. It's not where you store it for years. It's, it's where you store it, it's where you, main, it's where you access it for like this project, or this assignment, or this task, or this, I don't know, movie, or this song, or this play, like in, in sports, or this game. It's, it's not permanent. It's, it's brief. It has a limited capacity. That short-term memory. Your brain's computer screen. Okay. So, if I said to you right now, let's go back to classical conditioning. All right, pull that out of your long-term memory, if it's there. And it probably is. Okay, day, knee, powder, salivation. What else? Pavlov, what else? Stimulus, response, condition, neutral, right, okay. See, you just did it. You brought it from long-term into short-term. You brought it from permanent memory store into your brief, here it is, I'm paying attention to it, short-term slash working memory. That's how, that's how it functions. Okay, now, go to where it says A, capacity limitations. The average person, some are a little more, some are a little less, but the average person using short-term memory can, can work with, memorize, seven unrelated items. Seven unrelated items. So, yeah, let, let, me, let me go into this in a little more detail. Um, we're we're going to play, probably next class, I, I told you about this, the game Simon. It's this flashing light and sound game. And I think there are six colors and six different sounds. And it'll go like beep, 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 and you just have to try to repeat it back. Most people on this game will count out, like, they'll, they'll lose it somewhere around 10, 12, but that's not a good indication because there are only six possibilities. There's a version of, like, Simon Memory Game, if you've ever seen uh, maybe an electronic keyboard, a synthesizer. Now then you've got what? How many, how many keys are on a piano? 60, 64 maybe? 72, 80 something? I, I don't even know. So if you had random keys, 80 keys plus, and it was a pattern, most of you would sort of cock out around seven. Seven is the average capacity limitation for the average person using short-term memory, working memory. There's even a theory that says initially that's why phone numbers were seven numbers long because people could repeat those seven numbers for as long as they needed it. Like, oh, hey, order a pizza. Okay, what do you want, Renos or Manja? Oh, let's do Renos. Okay, what's the number? 372-1864. All right, got it. 372-1864. 372-1864. Oh, it's busy. Shoot, I forgot. Well, just hit what? Just hit I think it might be. It. I, thought it was a, I thought it was the Civil War, like 1861 or 1865. Google that. Brenda's number. You guys dying? Want to order pizza? <laughs> oh, you hope it is true. Okay. I like Brenda's too. I don't know if that's it. Anyone know? Anybody find it? What's done? The internet? Which one are we talking about? The Mio Gelato? Or? Oh, yeah, you're right there, too. I'm talking about the one in the mall. Yeah, go ahead, you get that, please. Thank you. 372-8145. That ah, way off. Okay, oops. So I don't know why I went with this. Well done. <laughs> As opposed to 373. Okay, so capacity limitations, roughly seven on average. Now, watch this. In terms of duration, not the number of items, but the time, 
It's around 20 seconds. 20 seconds without rehearsal. 20 seconds without practice. So if we were playing the game Simon, and we'll do this next class, and you had like, you got up to 12 or 15, beep, 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 and then you stopped. If you waited more than 20 seconds, it would be hard for you to duplicate it. Because short term memory, working memory, has a capacity limitation. Now, let's try an experiment. I am going to say to you some random words. And I'm going to ask you to repeat them back to me. See, it's what I said before, but now you know what's coming. Ready? Do they have to be in the same order? They have to be in the same order. Here we go. I can't even read my own writing. I'm, my vision's terrible. Bell, goat, and, soft, purpose, should, if, can't, loosen, extreme. Bell, bell, and, soft, promise, should, purpose, if, soften. Nope. Wait, I'll, I'll do it again. Bell, goat, and, soft, purpose, should, if, can't, loosen, extreme. Bell, goat, and, soft, purpose, should, if, can't, extreme. No. Loosen, extreme. That's not bad. Cheater. <laughs> that's, that's tough to do. Now, that was... One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven words. Ready? Let's do it again, but I'm going to give you one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve words. Well, that's going to be harder. Nope. I'm going to say it faster, too. The best way to maximize short term memory capacity is through chunking. The best way to maximize short term memory capacity is through chunking. Okay, which leads us to chunking. Which sounds bad. Okay, I'm done with that. So, if you go to B, chunking. I like throwing up or something. But it, it, in cognitive psychology, it just means lumping things together. Like chunking things together so that it makes it easier to memorize. Um, sentences are easier to remember than random words. Get it? That's what that was supposed to demonstrate. Dates are easier to remember than just random numbers. Question? So it's like relating something that's not related to something that <laughs> they, they make, to memorize it easier? Yeah. It's like when we play this, bless you, when we play the Simon game, one of the best things that can happen when it's your turn is if the first three or four are the same one in order. Like, eh, 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 because in your brain you make that one. You know what I mean? It's like one item, even though it's four. Um, if, uh, if, if I'm, if I'm playing quarterback, you know, it's, it's, I'm supposed to know what everyone's supposed to do. That's hard to do. That's a lot of content. So I, I tend to like chunk things together in terms of like positions and where on the field. Go ahead. Um, so in the car, like when we're going along, places far away, yeah. we'll play the alphabet game. Yep. We're going to do that too. Like Not in a car, but we're in a car. That's super easy, but I don't know if it's because someone before you is saying exactly what you're supposed to be. Like, it, right? It's not easy for everybody, but the people who find it maybe less than challenging, and it sounds like you're in that category, it's because you're doing it over and over again. You're rehearsing it. You're repeating it. You've got a visual clue because you can kind of see the person who went before you or after you, and it's all framed around a sequence, the order of the alphabet. So that helps too. Go ahead. I thought that game was like, like, okay, animals, egg, okay. You can, but she's talking about, I'm going on a trip and I'm bringing apple, going right? Picnic, and then, I'm going on a trip and I'm bringing an apple and a banana, and then you're up. Going on a trip, I'm bringing an apple, banana, and, okay, okay whatever. So we'll do this. Not now, but we'll do this. Hold that thought. I think what makes it easier, not easy, but easier for some, is the sequence and the visual. All right. So chunking, chunking, you're, you're packaging several units together as one. It's like a shortcut. Um, yes, sentences are easier to remember than random words. Bless you. 
If anybody play chess? Okay. Are you good? No. Do you want to play sometime? Yeah. I like chess. I like playing chess. And you, you have to think in terms of moves ahead. And you have to kind of see the whole board, but that's 64 squares. That's hard to do. So if you're, if, when you get good at it, and, you, and I'm not great, but uh, I'm okay. Like I'm probably above average. You, you memorize different zones of the board. Like you do that, that's a form of chunking. Yep. So here again, another example. These notes are so old. Like I'm, supposed to, I'm trying to read that bottom line. It's all frayed. But here we go. Uh, I'm going to give you some random letters, and you say them back to me. Ready? C, I, A, M, T, V, F, B, I, N, A, T, O. C, I, A, M, T, V, F, <laughs> All right, let's try it again. Ready? CIA, MTV, FBI, NATO. Oh, CIA, FBI, whatever. NATO, like NATO, Northland Treaty Organization. Okay, see, that's chunking. All right, move on to letter C. Rehearsal. Now, this is where it gets sort of cognitive psychology particular. What Chloe just asked about with the alphabet game, my answer was, you're rehearsing it. You're doing it over and over and over again. Like when we do this in class, and I'll play too, we go around the room and when it's your turn, you know, oh, I don't want to mess up. There's no shame if you do. But some people think, oh, there's pressure. I don't want people to think I have a bad memory. Whatever. And, and because you rehearse it so many times, it tends to stick. Listen, here's the key point. Does it stick in your short-term working memory, or does it go into your long-term memory? It depends. There's something called maintenance rehearsal. That's where you just repeat it for as long as you need it. This is some. This is kind of like limbo. I, I don't want to make this more complicated, but there's short-term memory, working memory, computer screen, and then there's long-term memory, hard drive. Sister friends, pay attention. But then there's sort of an in-between. There's sort of an in-between. I, I think I asked you this on Monday. I can't remember. Uh -huh. Pun intended. If you, you, you probably studied for a test before, and then when you took it, gone. You don't care anymore. You don't need it. It's gone. Yep. That's a type of maintenance rehearsal. You're, you're, just, you're just sort of reintroducing it into your short-term memory, but eventually you don't care. It's gone. It's gone. The day we play the alphabet game, you'll probably rehearse it, and you'll probably do okay, but then if I were to ask you about it a couple weeks later, eh, it's probably gone. You might remember some of it, but not the whole thing. I, I have one student who took psych last year, I think it's Kristen Snyder, Kristen Snyder, and she still swears she can remember the alphabet game that we played. Now, she probably can, for whatever reason. She could be making it up, because I sure don't, right? I sure don't because I've played it so many years and I get them all confused. But that's what's called maintenance rehearsal. Just keep it for when you need it. Elaborate rehearsal is where you repeat it so many times, you drill it, you practice it, routine, regimen. That's how you move information from short term to what? Long term. For the most part, if it's if it's something factual, if it's a name, a date, a concept, a formula in math, you probably don't care that much about that. So if you really feel like you're going to need, need to know it long term, you do elaborate rehearsal and it goes into your long term memory. There are some things that instantly go into your long term memory. Maybe it's something horrible, something traumatic, something that was so multisensorial, like visceral, major impact on your life, that bam, it's instantly in your long-term memory. That happens with episodes, but details, facts, stuff that you need to know for the test, stuff that you need to know for your career, stuff that you need to know for the SAT that you're going to want to know even beyond that, that takes elaborate rehearsal. 
Maintenance rehearsal just keeps it in short term. Elaborative rehearsal or elaborate rehearsal puts it in your long term memory. Got okay, it. got it? Yeah, exactly. So, D, retrieval. Because that's really what memory is about. You got to go get it. So, retrieval, you bring it back when you need it. I pluck it out of my hard drive. I don't have a hard drive, but you know what I mean. I pluck it out of my long term memory. You know, ask, ask me some, ask me about some random episode of what might have happened in my childhood. Okay? Yesterday the class said, the other psych class said, you remember learning to ride a bike. Okay? And I thought back to it. And I remembered all the details of the person who taught me to ride a bike. It wasn't my parents. It was a neighbor kid who lived across the street from me growing up. Now this is weird. This is actually kind of tragic. His name was Keith Reed. He was the superintendent of like the Chautauqua School, the guy that got shot a few years ago by a jealous husband. Anybody remember that story? That's who he was. He taught me to ride a bike. He taught me how to ride, ride like a two-wheel bike. And sadly, I think it's about four or five years ago now, he was killed by some guy that came up from North Carolina and shot him while he was hiking in his backyard. I guess there was like some marital trust there. Yeah, yeah. And, but see, but see what I just did there? When they asked me about that, I hadn't thought about it in a long time. I had actually forgotten that he was the one who taught me how to ride the bike. I forgot that. Even when that, even when that murder thing was being investigated, and it was in the news, and it was like on Dateline NBC, it was like a local thing, I had forgotten about the fact that he taught me, not the only one, but he's the one that kind of got me over the hump of actually doing it without training wheels, taught me how to ride that bike. I could picture the bike. I could see the colors. I knew where I was on the street. See what I just did? I plucked it out of my long term. I put it in my short term. Um, I retrieved it. I retrieved it. Now there are different types of retrieval. Effortless and effort dependent. Effortless. Oh, right now I'm speaking to you in the English language. You, for the most part, Sometimes people accuse me of using big words. But for the most part, you know every word I'm using right now. You know what it means. Some of you take French. Show of hands. Some of you take Spanish. Show of hands. Okay. When Ellison or Clausen speak to you in those languages, they probably have to go slower. Because you don't have instant recognition of every word. Once you become fluent, you will. You will. For now, in English, word recognition for you, word recognition for you, okay, is effortless. In a different language, it's probably effort dependent. You probably have to think about it. If you stay at it, you'll get to a point where that too is effortless. Now, another version of that is implicit and explicit memory. Implicit is yeah, it's, it's something you don't have to think a whole lot about. Muscle memory in sports. Word recognition, like I just said. That's implicit. It's so, it's so ingrained into your long-term memory, you've got it. You don't need to think about it. Explicit requires concentration. Explicit is like solving for X. Explicit is, all right, list the presidents in order. Explicit is, okay, Give me, give me the formula for Pavlov's experiment. You can do it, but it takes more thought. It takes more concentration. It, it takes more focus. Sometimes, sometimes you need clues. You need hints. You, you need help. That's, that tends to be more effort dependent. And there's even something called cue dependent. And, and I talked about this a little bit on Monday. At the beginning of the year, when I'm still trying to learn names, and as I age, it gets harder, partly because I'm not as sharp as I used to be, but also because over 30 years, there are more names there, right? So when, when I see you at the football game, that first home game, 
and somebody says hi to me, and I just talked to you in class a few hours earlier, and I said your name, and I knew your name, and you were sitting right there, but now you're not sitting there, I don't have the cue. I need the cue. That's, that's somewhere between effortless and effort dependent. Hey, guess what? There's even such a thing as cue, de uh, cue dependent forgetting, where you know it, you remember it, you're good to go, and then maybe I plunk the test down in front of you, gone. Did you ever have that happen? Did you ever have like something you really prepared for, but then bam, it's go time, and there's almost like a memory choke, right? It's happened to me too. That's, that's cue dependent forgetting. Memory's complicated. Short-term memory's complicated. Let's move on to number three, long-term memory. Okay, long-term memory. Your permanent memory store. You know, your, your earliest childhood memory. What is it? Go ahead, Clint. It's really embarrassing. It's not with Hey, you know the one I shared with you about me. It can't be worse than that, but go. So I ended up sticking puzzle pieces up my nose one huh? night, and I kept, like, sneezing because mm -hmm. I couldn't... They weren't coming out, so my mom had to like sit on my chest with tweezers oh, good point. and like pull them out. What did Papa Kyle do through all this? Um, he <laughs> wasn't there. He was in the. <laughs> so you jammed puzzle pieces up your nose. Yeah, they were like super small. Do you know how old you were? No, but I knew. No, I was really small because I couldn't like breathe when she was on my chest. Wow, that could have been pretty dangerous. <laughs> yeah. well, so, so going forward in adulthood. I don't want you to put things up your nose either, all right? No snorting, he said to the camera. Okay, so, uh, others? Earliest childhood memory? Taylor? Um, I was really young because um, the, the wooden playpen that you could just fold up and lift it out. Yep. Yeah, I was walking around with just a diaper, but I remember being at a campsite, and it was, I think it was where my Aunt Tanya used to go. Good old and Aunt Tanya. I remember the smell of like hot dogs and hamburgers and just um, standing there and looking at my parents. So what are you thinking? Two, three, somewhere in that range? I think so. It's rare saying. for it to be less than three, but it's possible. Possible. Others? Others. When I was really small, my... Remember, you're on camera. <laughs> the audio is anyway. Go ahead. My, my mom and dad and I looked at my grandma for a little bit, and I remember my grandma giving me a bath, but I was running around her house, like, not wanting to get in Oh, that's adorable. It was. And a little child porny. <laughs> but, okay. but my sister was, like, throwing stuffed animals at me the whole time, too. Oh, that, that little <laughs> dicks in her. All right. Nevi? So, this wasn't, like, a memory. It was, like, a dream. So, that was a dream. That was technically a separate category, but go ahead. Yeah, it was a dream where I was... I was probably like two or three because it was when my dad was still living with us. Mm -hmm. I remember that part. Mm -hmm. and, um, oh, I know him. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I was probably like two or three. And I just remember the dream was like I was in this realm of monsters. And all the monsters were super nice. They were really fun and they like wanted to hang out. But then there was this one monster that looked like Mike Wazowski, but he had a body. I was going to ask if you'd just seen Monsters, Inc. or maybe read Where the Wild Things Are or something, but go ahead. And it, it was like Mike Wazowski, but he had a body, and he was chasing me because he wanted to eat me in this only Oh, that's um, traumatic. Yeah. But that you think that's your earliest memory? Pretty sure. Okay. My earliest childhood memory is definitely eating my twin in the room. It was pretty traumatic. Yeah, twin. I, was, I was eating it. I was a little bit hungry. So there was a twin? No. Okay. Okay, Kevin. That would be so funny. Yeah. I was about to call BS on that, but I just wanted to indulge you. Grace? <coughs> or, I don't know, did you volunteer? No. Okay. Kate? Oh, when I was like, really good friendship, I think it was like second grade. No, it was first. Yeah. Um, I remember being in the bathroom and my mom was dating so, like, she was with someone else. Like, okay. And we were, I was jumping on her bed. Of course, Steve. I'm pro but go ahead. And she was, and she yelled at me for jumping on her bed. And her boyfriend was like, no, she's a kid, let her do it. And I ended up putting my head on a glass table. Ooh, that's traumatic. <laughs> and I ended up on the hospital. Do you know how old? Uh, I was in first grade, but I don't oh, okay. know. Oh, so. okay. So. Okay. I think I legit, I was Let me go, Lane. Birthday boy. Oh, so baby. Hi. So, I had uh, this babysitter. Uh, 
that. Oh, I like where this is going. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I went to um, every day because my mom worked, my dad worked too, so she would take us to this. Her name was Diane. Kathy. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Continue. And uh, she she took us to this woman, Diane. I remember um, riding on this four wheeler out to this pond that they had and feeding huge koi fish that they had in the pond. Oh. Right. <laughs> so, again, okay, did you say what do you think age wise? I think it was a, that was a toddler. Two so or three two or three? Old. That's possible. Um, All right. Caleb. I had okay, so I had dental surgery. You had what surgery? Like dental. Like, All right. So I was in the hospital for like a week after that, and I remember like the nurses coming in. And I can't they, see um, it past Lucas's bulbous head. Okay, go ahead. What's problem? I'm not <laughs> They'd always come in and like, if I was like scared or something, because I did like the hospital, they would like sing the song to me. Oh. And I still remember every word of the song. Can you give us a taste? I'm not singing. Okay. <laughs> so, did you say how old? I was like four. So okay. That sounds about right. Others? I was in the hospital one time when I was little because I couldn't breathe. Okay. Oh. Is it because Jake was tormenting you? And no, I, I, like, I don't know. I had a bed. I don't know. I couldn't breathe when I was little and they used to have to make me eat. Yeah. Like, what do you think? Three? I wasn't even like three. Like, so maybe. Like two or three. Okay. But, like, I don't know if that was my first one. No, it's possible. Um, Trey? I was sitting on my grandma's lap and I'm like getting my roof tag off. Oh. Yeah. That was, that was was cool. awesome. <laughs> what do you think? Two or three? Yeah. Is this about no, fetal cannibalism or what? Um, <laughs> when I was two, me and Colson went to play outside and we had a big golden retriever. His name was Morgan. He's a really cute. I wish we saw him. But Colson could jump over our fence on our porch to escape Morgan because his crate was like right around the like outside of our porch, like where we step off. And so close we could jump over it so I didn't have to go through mold again. <laughs> but I had to walk down the stairs and go around through because I was too short. And the dog tagged me and broke my leg. Oh no. Yeah. Two, three? Two. 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 I, go ahead. Well, I love that dog. I don't, I had to been like three or four, but my mom would always take me to my great grandfather's and I didn't like his wife at all for some reason. So I would stand at their door and I remember they had like a stained glass like window in between and I just stand there pounding on it until she came and got me and she worked for a long time. So I just remember staring at like standing at the door crying. Wait, so I thought, <laughs> you know. Now think, think about it. These these are episodes, these are events from your life that you probably haven't thought about in a while. So you plucked into, you, you basically brought stuff back from long-term memory. Look, I'm going to be 54 in a month. And I, I don't, listen, I don't think this is something that I've concocted through dreams. I remember, I, I, I swear, I hooked me up to a polygraph, um, I, I remember my parents, I remember being put in the back seat of a white Volkswagen and like buckled in. And when I, I remember talking to my parents about it, like they had a, a white VW when I was an, an infant and a toddler. And my dad says, man, we got rid of that car when you were about one and a half. And my mom said, no, you might have been two. To remember that far back, that's, that's a stretch. I also remember going to visit my grandparents. My, my grandfather was a congregational minister and he was at a church in Vermont. And I remember going to visit them in Vermont. We got there really late at night. And I like, I, I knocked on the door and they answered. And they go, wake up, you got company, you got company. And I was, oh, that's so cute. And I, I could not have been more than three years old. So that's reached pretty far back. Okay, we'll finish this. Oh, I won't be here Friday, so bring something to do. Bring work. Sorry, yeah, I'm out.